Hello and welcome to another episode of Other Items of Interest. I'm your host, Jack Zablocki. On this week's show, we have UFOs, Swiss cheese, Hitler, and overdue library books, plus much, 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 much more. Not that much more, just enough. 25 years later, one of Michigan's most famous UFO events remains a mystery. This comes from WWMT.com, West Michigan. The more I looked at it, I'm seeing four lights and they are like the size of the full moon, said Cindy Pravda, 25 years after strange lights lit up the horse pasture behind her Grand Haven home. She remembers the night vividly to this day. It wasn't helicopters, it was nothing else I could explain, Pravda said. She described the lights as circular and bright white, with well-defined edges. She said four total lights aligned just above her tree line. She said one vanished after about 15 minutes, with the remaining three lingering for another 15 minutes before disappearing. During the night of March 8, 1994, newsroom phone lines lit up with reports of strange lights hovering and flickering over some lakeshore towns. MUFON is a um, mutual UFO network. They study UFO sightings that are reported to them. Uh, there was a MUFON investigation from March 8, 1994 that involved over 300 eyewitness accounts, many of which involved multiple people viewing the same light source together. The investigator for MUFON said one family in Holland called the police. An officer sent to their home corroborated their report, witnessing strange lights as well. At that time, the local dispatch center contacted a radar operator at the National Weather Service. Multiple strange radar echoes were noted by the radar operator, who described three returns at times in a triangular pattern, changing location and moving southwest. Ernie Ostuno, a current meteorologist with the National Weather Service, said the radar returns could have been something called clutter. This occurs when radar beams bend down towards the surface of the Earth, echoing back returns from objects close to the ground. While clutter could explain the strange radar returns, what hundreds of Michiganders saw that night still remains a bit of a mystery. Pravda said she still believes she saw some sort of unidentified aircraft that night. She also said the next day a helicopter landed in a blueberry field in a neighboring property, something she had never witnessed before or since. So Michigan was visited by aliens in the 90s. Nobody figured anything out, as far as we know. Okay, on to the next story, I guess. Actually, if you check out the show notes, um, there are... I hope I'm not making this up. Well, I can't find it right now. But I think there are some of the 911 calls for um, people witnessing the UFOs. So that's worth checking out. Good fortunes. The U.S. psychic industry has grown 52% since 2005 to reach $2.2 billion in revenue last year thanks to wider acceptance of the supernatural, report finds. That's good news, isn't it? Charlatans making bank. Back to the article. Pardon me. They come seeking insights on love, money, and lost loved ones. It's really sad. It's what it is. Uh, some find answers and relief, others find a reason to keep coming back, paying each time for the answers they crave. Whether it's palm readers or astrologers, experts in tarot or mediums who connect with the dead, the psychic industry is booming, according to a new report. Revenues have grown 52% since 2005 to reach ne nearly $2.2 billion in 2018, the most recent year of which data is available according to an IBIS World Industry Report obtained by DailyMail.com. It's really something, isn't it? It's, it's all marketing because uh, you can't prove that you're really a psychic. I mean, you'd have to really get the lottery numbers or something. So it's just mostly marketing and it's working. That's what's crazy about it. Anyway, uh, the industry has rebounded along with the post-recession economy and a growing acceptance of the metaphysical or supernatural. The industry's growth comes as personal religious beliefs in the U.S. have become more flexible and accepting. More than a quarter of Americans have left the faith they were raised in, and 16.1%, 16.1%, not 60, as I mumbled over my words yet again, 16.1% consider themselves unaffiliated, according to Pew. I don't think the susceptibility or gullibility of Americans has changed over the decades, said Michael Shermer the publisher of Skeptic Magazine and teacher of critical thinking at Chapman University. 
I like Michael Shermer. I, I see him interviewed a lot. Uh, he is a skeptic, a staunch skeptic. It's interesting to listen to. But when he says, I don't think the susceptibility or gullibility of Americans has changed over the decades, I beg to differ. What we're witnessing is probably more internet access for promoters of psychics to spread their business more, he told DailyMail.com. See, promoters, promotion. Uh, at the same time, the industry is contending with escalating local regulations as a growing number of states pass ordinances requiring background checks, registration fees, random inspections, and limits on how many psychics can work within a given area, according to IBIS World. When I say IBIS World, all I think of is BS World, or IBS World, you know, Irritable Bowel Syndrome. Some 15% of Americans have consulted psychics or fortune tellers, and women are twice as likely to visit one, according to Pew Research Center. I keep an open mind, said Lynn Dolan, a 58-year-old from Mendham, New Jersey, who visits psychics, mediums, or tarot card readers two or three times a year. What I primarily get from these visits is a new perspective that gives me an aha moment, or a new idea from what my train of thought has been. That gives me something to reflect on, and I appreciate that, she told DailyMail.com. Uh, the psychic industry has a handful of major players. Uh, they change over time, because they were like Yuri Geller, that guy from the 70s. Now we have Long Island Medium, Teresa Caputo, and John Edwards, for instance, who are known for channeling dead loved ones seeking to communicate with people from beyond. Channeling dead loved ones seeking to communicate with people from beyond. Okay. But the majority of the industry is dominated by small players who made less than 44000 per capita in 2018, according to IBIS World. IBIS World. Sounds like the least fun Super Mario level ever. At the same time, there are more of those players. The number of psychic services pro professions rose from 89,000 in 2018 compared to 78,000 in 2005. Uh, the highest concentration of psychics is in Florida. Thank you, Florida. You're always, you're always giving us presents, giving the rest of the country presents. 14.4% uh, of the entire industry works in Florida. California came in second, 12.5%, followed by New York, 7.2%, and Texas, 6.9%. Palm readers narrowly account for the biggest share of psychic workers, 23%, followed by tarot card readers, 21%, and mediums, 18%. Aura readers account for 15% of the industry, while astrologists make up another 12%, and 11% fall into none of those categories. What is that 11% that fall into none of the categories? What do they do? Uh, I'd be interested to know that. Go visit one of them. The fringe of the fringe. The challenge going forward will be attracting younger clients. Good luck. Adults younger than 30 account for just 11% of people who visit psychics. However, more psychics are looking to incorporate apps or video and other technology into the way they provide their services, which could appeal to a younger clientele. Nora Herald, 52, is an Ojai, Ojai, Ojai California-based worker in the metaphysical space. She calls herself a direct voice channel who connects with a collective conscious identity that exists on a higher dimension on behalf of her clients. Harold said her connection to beings in the fifth dimension, fifth dimension can help provide clients with a shift in consciousness and a deeper understanding of the greater truths in life, though she doesn't peddle hard predictions. <laughs> Wonder why. Imagine you're a being in a higher dimensional plane you're just chilling, doing whatever a higher dimensional being does. You start getting contacted by this middle-aged woman, asking inane questions of these strangers. How do you get out of that? Do you have to help? Being a high, higher dimensional being, do you have to help? Is it like a requirement, like a Boy Scout, that you have to help? I, I'm, I'm coming away with more questions and answers from this article. And to top it off, over the next five years, industry revenue is expected to continue rising, growing 0.9% each year to total $2.3 by 2024. And there you have it. You want to know what field to go into, kids? 
go into the scam business. That's where the money is. Dozens of dead animals once again found in Virginia woman's freezer. I don't know if this is uh, an item of interest really, but it's weird. This comes to us from Richmond.com, Richmond Times Dispatch, Virginia's news leader. What a title. Authorities in Virginia say a Virginia Beach woman has once again, once again, been found to be in possession of dozens of dead animals. The Virginian pilot reports authorities responding to the home Monday found more than 100 dead animals, 24 live cats, and a live dog. That poor dog. Poor cats too, but the one live dog, he's, he sees what's going on. He sees animals going into the freezer and not coming out. Or, or, he sees, he sees the animals go into the freezer the woman then for dinner goes to the freezer gets something to eat and the dog is like that's what's happening to the animals she's eating them it'll be a whole a whole uh like a detective case and it'll be animated of course and i think this would be a really good project to work on for a movie anyway Animal control supervisor Megan Conti says the dead animals had been stored in freezers or in plastic containers in the garage where they decomposed beyond recognition because that's what happens when you put dead things in plastic containers and then leave them in the garage. This isn't the first time so many dead creatures were found at... <laughs> creatures. This isn't the first time so many dead animals were found at a home belonging to Lisa D. Ross who wasn't re immediately reached for comment. In 2009, Ross's son was linked to a plot to kill high school students. Wow, this takes a turn, doesn't it, folks? Authorities searching her home for weapons found 120 cats. Half were dead. Similar discoveries happened again in 2012 and 2013. This is one of those stories that's just a goddamn nightmare. It's just... I would not wish this on anybody, I don't think. Maybe, I don't know. Like any... I'm not going to give up that so quickly. This one comes from Fox News. I know, Fox News. It's from the New York Post, though. Uh, New York woman sucked into parents' grave suing cemetery. I told you, a goddamn nightmare. A woman visiting her parents' Long Island burial plot descended into more than despair. She sank hip deep into their grave, a lawsuit claims. And it kind of makes me wonder, uh, rereading the story, that she sank hip deep if she, um, her feet were touching the caskets. Back to the story. Uh, in the real life horror show, Joanne Cullen bent down to fix a bow on a wreath by the headstone when a sinkhole formed and began to swallow her up, according to court papers. It caused her to fall forward and smash her head on the tombstone, cracking a tooth, her lawyer said. She then tried to bounce back, and she started sinking into the ground and grabbed the sides of the tombstone. The stunned North Belmore, Long Island woman cried out for help, but no one in the graveyard could hear her screams. The creepy calamity occurred at dusk on December 19, 2016. Oh man, the whole setting is just fantastic. It's got that low-hanging sun setting it's going fast and you're sinking down into your parents grave and you can't get out the lawyer went on to say getting sucked into your parents grave when you go to visit them on a cool december afternoon with the sun going down it's terrifying and traumatizing the lawyer is um uh joseph obvious mr obvious he's a good guy but he tends to state things that we all already know now it's the St. Charles Resurrection Cemetery administrator's turn to shiver in fear after being hit by Cullen's $5 million lawsuit in Queens Supreme Court. The 64-year-old says the chilling incident in the Farmingdale Long Island graveyard, the final resting place of her bookkeeper mother Evelyn and roofer father John, has left her an emotional wreck. I will never go back there again, Cullen said through her attorney, adding she now fears walking in open fields and has nightmares and headaches. She also needs counseling now, the suit claims. Perini contends the grave diggers who backfilled an adjacent grave to Cullen's parents left an underground void that caused Cullen to sink into the netherworld. We're going to end the article with netherworld? Okay, fine. So that's just good times all around, I think.
Goat escapes slaughterhouse, runs loose in New York. Goat has a new home at a New Jersey sanctuary after escaping from a slaughterhouse and running loose in New York City. Animal care centers of NYC said police cornered the goat Sunday morning in the South Bronx after apparently escaping from a nearby slaughterhouse. The goat was brought to Animal Care Center, which gave the goat a clean bill of health. Congratulations, goat. Officials said the goat will have a new permanent home at Skyland Farm Sanctuary in Wantage, New Jersey. Wantage, New Jersey? Wantage, New Jersey? Whatever, the goat, the goat is free. Let's all celebrate the goat. We all want to be that goat. We want to get away from the slaughterhouse. We want to run around New York City. We want to be cornered in the Bronx by the cops. And we want to be left on a farm to live the rest of our lives. Right? I feel like after doing the goat noise for the goat story, I should do a, a pigeon cooing noise for this pigeon story. But I'm not, because I can't. Headline reads, Armando the racing pigeon sells for a record $1.4 million. They sold the pigeon for $1.4 million. There's a picture of this pigeon on the website. It looks like a pigeon. There's nothing special about this pigeon unless you consider... I don't know. I mean, if you're into pigeon racing, I guess, do you just spend money on that? A star racing pigeon named Armando has fetched a record 1.25 million euros, about 1.4 million dollars, in an online auction, Belgian media reported Sunday. The prized bird, Belgium's best long-distance racer of all time, according to those in the know, was snapped up by a Chinese buyer for the princely sum that caused a flutter of excitement among fanciers. Armando had been expected to break the previous record of 376,000 euros, or $425,000, paid for a pigeon called Nadine, but not by such a wide margin. Earlier this week, it became clear that Armando would be the most expensive pigeon ever sold in an online auction, wrote the specialist website Pigeon Paradise. Uh, specialist website Pigeon Paradise. Got me chuckling. However, no one expected that the magical cap of a million euros would be pulverized, it added. The final amount was 1,252,000 euros. All right, we got it. We know how much they paid for it in American and euros. Pigeon Paradise did not <laughs> Pigeon Paradise. Pigeon Paradise did not say who had bought the pigeon, but according to the Belgian news agency Belga, it was a Chinese buyer who will no doubt use his new acquisition to breed other champions. Armando was just one of more than a hundred birds sold by the respected Belgian breeder Joel Verschut. Verschut's stable of pigeons is based in Ingelmunster in the west of Belgium and his online auction of his pigeons has been open for several weeks. By Sunday, the family had sold 178 pigeons for around 2 million euros. That's ridiculous. I'm glad they had this as their uh, way of making a living, and I'm sure they love it and they're good at it. But pigeons, the, people call them rats with wings. They're not worth a million dollars. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry, though. People still say that? Sorry, not sorry? I hate that. Let's get back to the article, because this is just ridiculous. Uh, Vershoot told Pigeon Paradise that after a winning 2017 racing season, many people suggested he should retire Armando to the breeding loft, but he decided to keep his bird flying, and in 2018, Armando took first place in one of the biggest races in Europe. Surprising that there's more than one pigeon race. I thought I think you just like have one big one. Like some local one, small. Would you even have a small local one? This is baffling to me sometimes. A little bit, it makes sense. It's like, okay, this is their hobby. This is what they do. Then it just becomes baffling. And then I swing back around to, okay, this is their hobby. This is what they do. This is fucking baffling. Um, homing pigeons are raced by releasing them sometimes hundreds of miles from home with the first to make it back home winning. Racing them is a tradition in Belgium, Britain, Northern France, and the Netherlands, although it has been going into decline. But interest from Asian buyers in recent years has given the practice a new lease on life. One of the highest profile pigeon fanciers in the U.S. is boxing legend Mike Tyson, who showed off his fondness for the birds and the sport in a 2011 TV show which drew criticism from animal rights group PETA. Fuck PETA. Uh, I forgot about that Mike Tyson TV show. 
That's interesting. See, that's interesting. He's like a, he's like a big guy. He's known to be aggressive and violent, but then he would take care of these homing pigeons. It's very interesting. But paying a million dollars for a, a bird, I don't think so. If I if I captured a pigeon off the sidewalk, could I train him to be a homing pigeon? Or if I captured a pigeon off the sidewalk, I'm not going to capture a pigeon off the sidewalk. This is just hypothetical. If I was to get my hands on a pigeon, you know, nicely, gently, could I scam that pigeon to be worth $1 million? Would that be possible? I guess I'll be reading my own news article when I'm arrested, trying to pass off uh, illegitimate racing birds. And this story is brought to us by CBS.com. From the Associated Press, Germany, drunk passenger demands high-speed train slow down. German police say a drunken man with a fire extinguisher smashed his way into the driver's cab of a high-speed train running from Frankfurt to Paris and demanded that the driver slow down. Slow down! Yeah, slow down. Federal police said, is that okay for me to do? I'm German. I have German heritage. Am I allowed to do that? I don't know anymore nowadays what's what's acceptable and what's not. I apologize sincerely to all the German people out there. Yeah. Federal police said the ice train operated by Germany's Deutsche Bahn stopped near Frankfurt after the incident Sunday morning. The 30-year-old man from Heidelberg, who wasn't identified, was arrested and faces an investigation into dangerous interference in rail traffic, among other things. Police say passengers said the man took a fire extinguisher off the wall smashed a glass door separating the cab from the passenger compartment and told the shocked driver the train was going much too fast and he had to save the passengers. No passengers were hurt, but the train was taken out of service. He was trying to do a good deed. You know, the road to hell, paved with good intentions, right? <laughs> Here's an item of interest. Oregon blockbuster outlasts others to become last on Earth from Associated Press. The computer system must be rebooted using floppy disks that only the general manager, a solid member of Gen X, knows how to use. The dot matrix printer broke so employees write out membership cards by hand. And the store's business transactions are backed up on reel-to-reel -reel tape that can't be replaced because Radio Shack went out of business. Yet, none of that has kept this humble franchise in an Oregon strip mall from thriving as the advent of on-demand movie streaming laid waste all around it. When a blockbuster in Australia shuts its doors for the last time on March 31st, the Bend Oregon store will be the only one left on Earth. It's pure stubbornness for one. We didn't want to give in, said General Manager Sandy Harding, who has worked at the franchise for 15 years and receives a lot of the credit for keeping it alive well past its expiration date. We did everything we could to cut costs and keep ourselves relevant. The store was once one of the five blockbusters owned by the same couple, Ken and Debbie Tischer, in three central Oregon towns, but by last year, the Bend franchise was the last local blockbuster standing. A tight budget meant no money to update the surviving store, and that's paying off now with a nostalgia factor that stops first-time visitors of a certain age in their tracks. The popcorn ceilings, low fluorescent lighting, wire metal video racks, and the ubiquitous yellow and blue ticket stub logo that was cultural touchstone for a generation. The Bend store has had eight years under its belt as a local video store before it converted to a blockbuster in 2000. Then in 2010, the blockbuster declared bankruptcy, and by 2014, all corporate-owned stores had shuttered. That left only locally-owned franchises to fend for themselves, and one by one, they closed. When stores in Anchorage and Fairbanks, Alaska, shut down last summer, barely outlasting a Redmond, Oregon store, Bend's blockbuster was the only U.S. location left. Tourists started stopping by to snap selfies and business picked up. 
Harding ordered up blue and yellow sweatshirts, t-shirts, cups, magnets, bumper stickers, hats, and stocking caps from local vendors emblazoned with the words, the last blockbuster in America, and they flew off the shelves. Then, this month, she got a phone call. The world's only other blockbuster in Perth. Perth, Australia, would soon close its doors. A new t-shirt order went out, this time with the slogan, the last blockbuster on the planet. And the store is already getting a new wave of selfie snapping visitors as far away as Europe and Asia. The Ben store doesn't seem to be in danger of closing anytime soon. Here's another one from the AP. Person with unicorn costume, crowbar, Rob store. It's a nice get up. Unicorn costume and a crowbar. Apparently not all unicorns are the embodiment of purity and grace. Baltimore County police say a person dressed in a unicorn costume and wielding a crowbar tried to rob a convenience store Saturday morning in the Baldwin community. Officers arrived just after the high's store opening time of 5 a.m. to respond to the robbery call. I guess the store is called High, so that's clear. I was confused. It was confusing to read. I don't know if it sounded confusing. So I'm going to read it again. Officers arrived just after the High's store opening time of 5 a.m. to respond to the robbery call. There. Let's continue. Police say the suspect had fled in a silver car. They located what appeared to be the same car after it had wrecked. No other cars were involved in the wreck. They must have crashed into a tree or a telephone pole or something or who knows what. Police say two people involved in the crash were taken to a hospital and detectives are working to determine what their involvement was in the robbery. No charges were immediately filed. Police didn't say if money or merchandise was taken in the robbery. I'm guessing high is, this is Maryland. I don't know if they have a legal pot there. I want to know what high is. Somebody tell me, email me from Maryland. I want to hear from somebody from Maryland. Anyway, uh, unicorn costume and crowbar doesn't seem to work for robbing places, so don't think about it. If you attack somebody with pancake batter, are you charged with battery? Apparently you are. Florida man accused of throwing pancake batter faces battery charge from clickorlando.com. 45-year-old Florida man is accused of throwing a bowl of pancake batter at a woman who was making dinner. An arrest report says Dwayne Zimmerman was drunk Friday night when he went into the porch of a home where the woman was making pancakes. The woman told Hernando County Sheriff's deputies that Zimmerman insulted her and then threw a cooking pan before picking up the bowl of batter and tossing it at her. The bowl missed the woman but was thrown with enough force to break it. Deputies said the woman had pancake batter in her hair and on her clothes. Zimmerman was arrested on a fe felony battery charge. He remained jailed Monday. Jail records don't indicate whether Zimmerman has a lawyer. He should probably get one if he doesn't have one already. My two cents. Duo nabbed trying to steal Al Capone statue in Arkansas. This comes from Hot Springs, Arkansas from the Associated Press. Good old AP. It was a caper Scarface might have sanctioned until they dropped him and got collared. Authorities say two Missouri men snatched a statue of Al Capone from its seat outside the Ohio Club in Hot Springs, Arkansas early Saturday morning. Club owner Mike Petty told the Hot Springs Sentinel record that the men dropped it and he was able to chase them down and take back the statue. He, sa he says the statue suffered a broken fedora brim. Oh, a million neckbeards just cried out in horror. A broken fedora rim. brim, excuse me. I'm sorry, neckbeards. A uh, broken arm and leg amounting to about $3,500 worth of damage. The two Missouri men, Mason Potter Jr. and Andrew Vaughn, were charged with public intoxication and criminal mischief. Hot Springs, which is about 45 miles southwest of Little Rock, was once popular a destination for gangsters, including Al Capone. Imagine you're an artist and you sculpt, and um, somebody wants you to do one of Al Capone, and forget about all the romanticized bullshit about the mob. That guy was just a syphilitic thug. Syphilitic? Cephalic? What do, you, what do you call that when you have syphilis? I mean, he had it so bad. Uh, he went to Alcatraz. I don't think he came back like a normal person. He was kind of, he was like childlike, I think. 
Um, I think there's one picture of him after. Uh, I think he's sitting on his boat or something, or by the water, and he's in kind of like a, a bathing suit. Um, he doesn't look like a tough guy. He looks very meek. Anyway, Al Capone had syphilis. What are you going to do? From the New York Post, high school official apologizes for calling Hitler a good leader. Sometimes you open your mouth and you just say the wrong thing. This guy went a little too far though, just, just wait. The head of a New Jersey school district has apologized after a guest speaker dubbed Adolf Hitler a good leader and displayed the Nazi dictator's photo alongside, side by side, civil rights icon Martin Luther King Jr. Joe Pirro, athletic director of Nutley High School, made the controversial remark Saturday during a presentation for athletes at Madison High School, according to local reports. During his commentary, the speaker contrasted Dr. King and Hitler, referring to the latter as a good leader with bad moral character and intentions. Only one ball, too. That's what they say. Uh, that comment was made by Madison superintendent. Not the uh, one ball comment. The previous, I'm going to remake that comment so we're clear on this. During his commentary, the speaker contrasted Dr. King and Hitler, referring to the latter as a good leader with bad moral character and intentions, Madison Superintendent Mark Swartz wrote in a letter sent to parents Sunday, NorthJersey.com reported. And he had one ball. Not Swartz. Not Mark Swartz. Hitler. Accordingly, <laughs> shit, I've completely gone off the rails. Accordingly, it is the position of the Madison High School District that the inclusion of Adolf Hitler has no place in the context of an assembly intended to promote unity and character, Schwartz wrote in a letter. Schwartz got wind of Piero's comments from the attendees of the presentation and parents who voiced serious concerns. That being that there's a goddamn picture of Hitler two stories high in the gymnasium. According to Swartz, Pirro, who was not identified in the letter, also showed photos of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Yankee superstar Jer <laughs> Derek Jeter, and other notable positive leaders during the event, NJ.com reported. They should have got uh, Jeter's quote, should have asked him for a quote on, on the article, what he thinks about this since his picture was used next to Adolf Hitler and Martin Luther King Jr. for that matter. Does Jeter belong up there? Good ball player. I don't know if he's a positive leader. Is he? Okay. It was unnecessarily provocative and insensitive for the speaker to include the image of a criminal whose legacy includes a systematic torture and slaughter of millions of Jews, the disabled, and others in Eastern Europe, Swartz wrote according to NJ.com. He went on to say that in the future, any presentation given by an outside speaker will be screened by a school administrator. Smashing idea. Piro's presentation was not reviewed beforehand. No kidding. In a statement to NorthJersey.com, Piro admitted making the comment saying it was not his intention to offend anyone in or outside the Madison Public School District, and I am truly sorry if I did. My intentions during the presentation were to make a point that a leader could have strong leadership skills and influence people in a negative way. As a 20-year educator who has worked with a wide variety of students that came from very diverse and unique backgrounds, I fully understand and recognize that Adolf Hitler was an evil man who acted in a horrific manner, Pirro said. As I believe in learning from experience, I will remove the reference from my any future presentations. You think this guy's giving any future presentations? I don't. <laughs> From the Miami Herald, man returns library book 53 years late, he was killed. No, that's not true. He did return the book 53 years late, but let's just do the story. I won't make anything up, I promise. A New Jersey man says he has returned an overdue library book 53 years after he first borrowed the book. Fairlawn resident Harry Crame says he checked out The Family Book of Verse by Lewis Gannett from his school library when he was 13 and Lyndon Johnson was president. The now 65-year-old Crane found the book recently while cleaning out his basement and felt guilty about keeping it overdue for all those years. Memorial Middle School Vice Principal Dominic Tarquinio says a late fee at today's rate would be about $2,000. He made the old man pay up. 
Just kidding. I told you I wouldn't make anything up, but I did. I, I made a stupid joke. They're gonna, the district said they're going to let the, the fee slide. He's not going to have to pay the $2,000, okay? School librarian Susan Murray says she... My cat's name is Murray. How about that? Fantastic. School librarian Susan Murray says she plans to use the book for a display to teach students about returning books. Lesson well learned. Everybody wins. They got their book back. That's nobody. Nobody's going to take that book out ever again. The Family Book of Verse by Lewis Gannett. It'd be funny if there was a, if somebody else took it out immediately and just never returned it. This article is a little bit different. It comes to us from SwissInfo.ch, labeled or tagged, I should say, under Sono Chemistry. That's right, Sono Chemistry. Sono, Sonos, sound, chemistry. We know what chemistry is, I hope. Cheese exposed to hip hop tastes better, finds Swiss experiment. Sono Chemistry. Get it? They're using sound to change the chemical structure, I guess, of the cheese to make it taste different. Let's get on with the article, shall we? A quirky experiment that exposed Swiss cheese to different kinds of music found that hip hop made it taste the best. Eight wheels of Muttengluck, a mental cheese from World Cheese Championship winner, Anthony, I don't know if it's Wiss, Weiss, Viss, Weiss, it's hard with those names. It's W-Y-S-S. Anthony Weiss. Let's go with that. I like that. Subjected separately to different musical stimulus. Mozart, A Tribe Called Quest, Yellow, Led Zeppelin, Techno, and Three Sinusoidal Sound. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Sinusoidal. Sinusoidal? Sounds. Around the clock for eight months. The experiment was part of a collaboration between students at the University of Arts Bern and veterinarian Beat Wampfler, who came up with the idea. The project was baptized Cheese and Surround Sound, a culinary art experiment. Blind tasting test, eight, blind tasting test, a blind taste test, eight months. They call it tasting test over in uh, Switzerland, in Europe? Threw me off. A blind taste test, eight months later, found that the wheel exposed to hip hop had the most unique taste profile. The bacteria did a good job, Wampfler said on Thursday during the presentation of the results. The sensory analysis revealed that the cheese that was exposed to hip-hop was remarkably fruity, both in smell and taste, and significantly different from the other samples. We were overwhelmed, says Professor Michael Harenberg, who provided the scientific support for the experiment. At first, I thought it was a typical Swiss reaction, because cheese plays such a big cultural role here in em em mental, excuse me, em mental. But even journalists from South Africa approached us for interviews and information. Uh, they have a list of tracks used in the experiment, and that's always the best part of the article, a list. Uh, so here we go. Number one, no sound, reference box. Number two, ambient, yellow, monolith. Number three, classical, Mozart, magic flute. Four, techno, uh, viral, UV. Five, rock, Led Zeppelin, stairway to heaven. That's not a good rock Led Zeppelin song. I mean, it's a great, of course, great Led Zeppelin song, but for rock, they could have done something better. Uh, number six, medium frequency, 200 hertz. Seven, high frequency, 1,000 hertz. Eight, hip hop, a tribe called Quest. We got the jazz. Nine, low frequency, 25 hertz. And that's what Cheese is listening to. And that's that, folks. That's another show, another episode down. This was Other Items of Interest. I was your host, Jack Sablocki. Music by Honed Flesh Jet and uh, the very hardworking crew at Other Items of Interest recording and editing said show. See you next week, everybody. Bye-bye.